All right, let's look at Psalms then. Psalm 42 and 43. And um, what the Bible says for us. Trusting God in dark times. Uh, I'm sorry? Wasn't that something? You know, it's like one of those days that everybody remembers where you were on that day. Um, dark times. A lot of the Psalms, some have said as maybe as high as 62 of the 150 Psalms are what's referred to as lamenting Psalms. Psalms that are talking about the tough times, the down times, the struggles of life. And, uh, of course, David didn't write all of them, but you and I can understand why David, a man after God's own heart, had some of the dark times that he had. Um, David made some mistakes, led to some of his hurtful times, his dark times, his down times. Uh, he made some mistakes. He had a lot of enemies, David did. And so that led to a lot of his oppression or despair uh, because he was enemies. You know, I imagine being king back then was about like being president today. You know, every decision you make, half people are going to like it, and half people are not going to like it. <laughs> you know, uh, it's somewhat like being a pastor. But anyway, you just move along with that. <laughs> and and uh, you, 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 try to, uh, you try to live with those uh, decisions, to live with uh, the challenges. And I think most of us have probably had things that we've gone through in our life that we wish we didn't have to go through anymore. Uh, here's a man thinking about some things. Where is God in the bad times? Well, he's right where he's always been, isn't he? But even though God is there, have you ever had a hard time connecting with him? Finding him? Not that he's ever left or moved, but just have you had trouble connecting with God? Where is God in those times? I believe he's like the, the prodigal father. I believe he's standing out on the, on the edge of heaven looking for you, listening for you to call. And he's that kind of God that's not too busy. Does he care about my troubles? He does care, doesn't he? More than we know does God care. He cares about me. He cares about where I'm hurting. The Bible says he knows every hair on my head. He knows every. The Bible says he's got every star uh, named in the heavens. Uh, hey, 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 quit laughing about my head. It's just like us. Anybody could do that. But he, he cares about what I'm going through. He cares about the details of my life. He knows my needs, Jesus said, before I even ask. Now, that's a concerned God. He cares about my needs. Can I trust? He is there, and He wants to help. By the way, I didn't do y'all a little fill-in-the-blank worksheet today, so get your pens out and write on the handout I gave you tonight. You can take some of these, if you want to. I mean, if, if you want that. I didn't make a handout this week. Um, can I trust He's there and wants to help? Do you believe that about God? That He's there? As long as we understand in those times of felt separation and in those times of desperation, in those times of feeling lost and separated from God, that the problem is usually us. It's not God. As long as we understand that first. And that's what we see in the psalmist tonight uh, as we study these, these psalms. Why doesn't God make all my troubles stop? Free will. Free will, okay. Well, you know, uh, maybe God's got, you know, some people look at God's sovereignty in such a way that God makes everything happen. In fact, God says in the Old Testament, have I not made the deaf and the mute? Did I not make them? Does that mean, though, that God makes every problem happen in your life? 
That's like saying, see, I don't believe he does. I don't believe that God, does he know about it? Oh, yeah. But, huh? That's right. And a lot of the things that we go through, God is allowing us through those things that we may really get to a place of brokenness. You know, the Bible says those who are of a broken and contrite spirit will God revive. That broken, Habakkuk said, those who have that broken spirit. That's that place when we get down weeping before God. And that's that place where God meets us. Sometimes in the midst of a puddle of tears. God meets us there. And we're going to talk about that tonight, okay? A little bit. So this is just kind of introduction to this. Dark times create a desperation for God. They create a desperation for God. Boy, when I think about that, what does the Bible say here in the first verse of, of this psalm? Psalm 42. What does it say to us? As a deer pants for water, brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. You heard that, didn't you, Brother Whalen? You got to sing it. You didn't have you didn't have a choice. So sometimes the pastor has a recommendation, but when the pastor's mama says you got to do it, you got to do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But but you know the the thought here, the thought here, my so, verse two, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I think emphasis on that living God right there. Not some idol, not just some form of religion, but a living God. He's thirsting for that. And why? Verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night. And my tears say to me, where is your God? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that from your tears? (laughs) <laughs> where's your God? Isn't that what they said about Jesus on the cross? He said, oh, he's God. Let him save himself. That's what all the accusers said. That's what the devil loves to say. In those times of brokenness, in those times of weeping, to me it reminds me of like Jerusalem in, in the book of Nehemiah when Jerusalem's walls were down. The city was in shambles and it was a concern of Nehemiah to rebuild those walls because he said those walls being broken down put shame on God. It was an embarrassment to God. In other words, in other words, the city, the people, the name of God wept over this because of the condition. And it really pictured the spiritual condition of the city also. And so it was a picture there of of where is God? And that's what the, all the pagans of, of the, that day believed. Well, where's your God? Man, your city lies defenseless. Its walls are broken down. Where's your God? Sometimes we can ask that question. Where's my God? And why is He not here right now? So where is God when the dark days come? Sometimes the Lord brings us to the end of our rope to reveal the Sham of self-sufficiency. You see, sometimes we think that bank balance, that checkbook balance, is going to carry us on through. It can be gone like that. And it's not going to carry you anyway, is it? You can have all the money in the world. You know, some of the wealthiest people you and I know, uh, movie stars or athletes, some of the wealthiest people I know, I remember Deion Sanders one few years ago saying, it don't matter how much you got, it ain't enough to make you happy. It's not enough. You can have all the comforts of the world and be just empty and rotten and dead inside. And that's kind of like I said this morning, then a lot of people 
instead of turning back to God, they find themselves chasing the things like I was talking about this morning, whether it be drugs or alcohol or popularity or pleasure, whatever it may be. We find ourselves looking for for fake substitutes. And you know what the difference is of the substitutes of this world, th- those things of this world? Those things are pleasurable for a season, the Bible says. But they don't last. They're not the solution. They have to be something that is just a, it's an artificial high. And yet God wants to provide for us a joy like we talked about today. Uh, and one of the things he talks about in here, uh, my exceeding joy over in the next chapter, he talks about that again. So it's related to the sermon this morning and tonight relates so well. <clears throat> Second thing on there, sometimes something is so broken, it needs to get to the point of complete breakdown so God can get them to put things back together his way. You know, I've seen a lot of marriages that way. I've seen marriages that God didn't break them apart. <clears throat> but they're put together so wrong on so many of the wrong principles, the wrong priorities. And I believe sometimes God doesn't necessarily break them apart, but when they break apart, God wants them put back together right. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, guys going to get right because, you know, his wife left him, so he's going to get right. And, he thinks, pray with me, preacher. Pray with me. I'll, it, it'll be all right. I, pray with me, and we'll get this marriage worked out. And uh, Pray that I can go back home right now. And I'm not afraid to tell somebody, no, I'm going to pray that you go back home when you learned your lesson. Or, last few years, I've had to say that to some ladies, too. When, when you've learned your lesson, because if y'all just going to hurry back together the way you were, in two or three months, you'll be part again because you had a mess and you hadn't learned anything. And right now, this mess is broken up, but it needs some more breaking, maybe. Some of the junk needs to get out of there and then let God put it back together right. And I think that is so true in our lives sometimes. There, We have to get to a place sometimes where as someone has said before, I don't remember who it was, that we need to get flat of our back where we finally start looking up. We get so, so broken in our tears, as the psalmist said here, so broken about where we are that we really desire God. And that's what he says here in this first verse. As the deer pants for water, so must the water of my soul pants for you, my God. Have you ever thirsted for God? Have you and I ever Thirsted for God. Can anybody tell me about an experience in your life when you felt like if God didn't show up, you weren't going to make it very long? Anybody? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You need a miracle, didn't you? You needed to. And a miracle is the supernatural intervention of God. I, I can tell a time when we were, when our little boy Matthew was a year old, just like 12 or 13 months old, he got a sickness and uh, throwing up and everything and all kind of problems and wound up having to go to the hospital. And, and I remember the doctors saying, uh, that it, uh, yeah, I just went blank on the name for it, but it says no cure for it. Uh, Rye syndrome, was it Rye syndrome? Or is that? No, maybe it was roto, rotavirus or Rye syndrome. Maybe one. Of, I don't remember what it was, but there was no cure for it. And doctor said, I'm afraid, I'm not sure yet, I haven't got the test back, but I'm afraid that it could be that. And you're talking about your world coming apart when your little one-year-old child is laying there and, and you don't, nobody can help. Doctor don't have a medicine. 
Hmm? Yeah, y'all went through that. And he had to go for like five days. He couldn't eat anything for five days. Just lived off an IV, you know. And you just, during that time, you do more praying than you have probably in the last year. Simply because you have nowhere else to turn. Now, the world might want to go out and get drunk or get high or try to forget about it or whatever. But those who know God need to cry out to God. Those who have to understand at that point, man, I need God. But the point is this. Why does it take something like that to get us on our knees basically 24 hours a day? I'm not saying we can be 24 hours a day. But what brings us to that point of desperation? It's usually brokenness. Despair. When there's nowhere else to turn. And we're going to talk about a lot of that here today, okay? Psalm 42, 5. You'll see this three times in our lesson today. In 42, 5. And also in 42, 11. And then in 43, verse 5. Three times, he's the author of this psalm, which I say the author, Miss Janet texts me this week. She says, some people believe somebody else, like maybe Hezekiah wrote this psalm and others. And I said, I don't know. There's different opinions. You can read a lot of different people. And there's a few different people who wrote some of the psalms and things like that. The sons of Korah who did some of the music in their day and, and others. But uh, the author of our book uh, believes it was David. I, I tend to lean toward David. If I can't figure out anybody else for certain, I just hang it on David. I say David wrote it. Because David wrestled a lot with troubled spirits. He wrestled a lot with the will of God. And so three times he asked this question, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation. But when I look at this verse and I think about what it's saying, three times in these two Psalms he asked that very question. What about this? What about me, God? And he, he's talking, you know, it's kind of a picture there. You know, my stone hates it, but when I pick up my little rat terrier dog, I just reach down and grab him by the back of the neck, pick him up. He just goes, you know. I mean, he don't care. It doesn't hurt. But she said, don't pick him up like that, you know. And that's kind of what the picture I get of. It's kind of like a man grabbing himself by the nap of the neck and say, what in the world are you thinking Oh, my soul, talking to your own soul, talking to yourself and saying, what is wrong with you? Why, why do you feel so cast down? Stop and think about this for a minute. Do you ever get cast down? Sure we do. Can spiritual people get cast down? Get to just get down in their spirit and so, yeah. In fact, I, I believe the devil, one of the greatest tools the devil uses on us is discouragement. He loves to keep us discouraged. Why? Because if you're discouraged, you're not going to be effective for God. You're not going to go out there and talk to other people about victory in Jesus if you don't even feel like you have it yourself. You may be saved, but you don't feel like you have the joy of your salvation or the fullness of your salvation. So let's look at some things about this. Two chapters, these two chapters seem to deal with the, the battling of depression. The psalmist speaks to himself. Now, soul... Why are you cast down? And then he speaks out and says, but I'm going to hope in God and praise Him. Look at that question down there. Have you ever had anything bad happen to you that caused you to seek God? I know I, I asked that a while ago. Does anybody else know of something that caused you to seek God? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Amen. That's when you just you fall on your knees. There's nowhere else to turn, is there? Nowhere else to turn. How about with JJ? And same thing. Look at what's going on with him today. So much better. 
In this chapter, we see a process for overcoming depression and frustration. And that's what I want to get to. We're going to get to close out on this. We're going to talk about some steps you can take to overcome depression, uh, frustration. Let me ask you this question. Can Christians be possessed by the devil? Ah, you hadn't thought about that, have you? I hate to, I hate to, I hate to, I don't want, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I don't want to say, well, no, that's wrong, yeah. I don't believe a Christian can be possessed by the devil. And here's why I don't believe that. Because I'm already owned by God. And I have authority over the devil. So there's not room for God and the devil to both be in me. Amen? Now, I can be oppressed by the devil. I can be troubled by the devil. Uh, he can help bring depression in my life, but he can't take control of me. Okay? Uh, so I, I say that to say that's just something to think about as we go through this. It's not like the devil has control. He may not be able to take control of my life, but he sure can cause a lot of problems. Isn't he? All right? Look at this. We overcome the bad by remembering the good. We overcome the bad by remembering the good. If you're going through a real challenging time, you need to understand that God says, you can overcome this. I'm here for you. Look at verse, verse 4 says, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, and the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept a pilgrim's feast. I think that just means in Southern Baptist language, we had a covered dish dinner. In verse 6, he says, O oh my God, why is my soul cast down within me? Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, and from the hill of Mizar. In other words, from those holy places, some of those holy places of God. So, he says here, when we feel ourselves depressed, discouraged, we have to pause and remember the goodness of God. There's a bunch of things we're going to talk about here, okay? Verses 7 and 8, we see the psalmist is rehearsing in his mind the faithfulness and the loving kindness of God. Look what it says, verses 7 and 8. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Can you see what He's praying here? The, the depths, the waves, the billows of God's love and kindness, His grace. He's remembering those closer times he had with the Lord. He's remembering the faithfulness of God. Make sure I had all that. Okay. So the first thing we wanted to talk about uh, was the in those dark times uh, that it's important for you and I to remember to be thirsty for God. And when you and I face things, remember that we need to in those moments of hurting, remember that it's in those times God wants us to develop a thirst for Him. Not an extra fifth of whiskey. Not, not a, a, a trip off into the world. But to remember God and seek Him with all your heart. Okay. Put these others back up. The second thing. The second thing we see is dark times should create, and this is right out of your book. I mean, it's pretty close to what's in your book, the, the, the three sections in this, this uh, lesson, number three. The second one, dark times should create a dependence or a confidence in God's faithfulness. As we look through this chapter and we look at the things that, that, that the psalmist is saying here, he's discussing how he recounted the goodness of God. I love how he said here, remember when I went with them to the house of God. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's something about being in the house of God with the people of God. 
singing the praises of God. When a person pulls away from the church, when a person decides that they don't want to be involved, you know it and I know it, there's always people that slip in right at the, end, right at the beginning of a service after it gets started, and then they'll be the first ones to slip out. They never come by the pastor and shake his hand and say, hey, preacher, how's it been this week? You know, they just kind of in, they got their church stuff done, and they're out. I'm not saying they're bad people. They're not. But I'm saying they're missing out on what God has for them in the fellowship of believers. And how important it is that we see that. You know, the verse that's mentioned right here, the verse 1 Peter 4 12 and 13, he said, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which, uh, which is to try you as some strange thing that happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you are partakers, or you, or you partake of the Christ's sufferings, that when his, joy, his glory is revealed, look at this last part, that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Right back to what I was preaching about this morning, isn't it? God's desire in these things that you go into and go through are about bringing you into the joy of the Lord. What does the joy of the Lord look like? What does this exceeding joy look like? I, I commented this morning, and I, I apologize to all of you, I, I kind of forgot to, I didn't go back and finish it. But I started talking about, well, Jesus didn't go around telling jokes. He wasn't the one to stand up comedy in the, in the club. You know, he, he probably wasn't the life of the party because, you know, th that's not what the kind of joy this is talking about. There's a difference in joy and happiness. There's a big difference in joy and happiness. Joy is something internal that the world can't give you and the world can't take away. Now, happiness can be governed by your circumstances. You got some bad circumstances, you're not real happy right now. But that doesn't take away that inner joy and that inner peace that you have with God. And so it's important that we understand when we talk about that exceeding joy, somebody tell me what that looks like. What does exceeding joy look like? Y'all all look at me like, you're the teacher. That's right. But what does joy look like? What is joy? I'm going to stand here. I'm in no hurry. I mean, I've got another 15 minutes. Okay. What else? No, I think what you said there, and I think it would be fair to use Sandy as an example of that. She's been going through cancer and cancer treatment. And yet you can't, you can't see any difference. You can't see. You see those cancer treatments, it can make you mad at God. It can make you frustrated. It can make you say, well, why I got to go through this? I put my tithe in church every week, you know? Why I got to go through this? You know, you'd be surprised that people think because they tithe, they're paid up with God and they shouldn't have any problems in their life. I think it too is a lot of it is that we have to not Yeah. 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 That's what it says rejoice and be glad. Because his glory, that when we partake of Christ's sufferings, so he says, you're going to suffer like I suffered. When we partake in the pains of this world, that his glory is revealed when we walk with the Lord. And that's what he's saying here. You and I need that inner settledness, that inner 
excitement, that inner expectation that says, we, when I say we, me and God, we got this. Right. Yeah. It's just like, you know, anybody could say, said, I'm going to smile through this thing. And if I die, guess what? I go to heaven. I get healed. I get permanently delivered, you know. I, I, I'm in a win-win. Understand that as a believer, we're in a win-win situation. The world can't say that. But we're in a win-win situation. God has already punched my ticket to heaven. Can he follow, can he follow through on that? Not only can he, he will. He will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, in these times of depression, in these times of hurt and agony I may find myself uh, I, I may find myself wondering what God what God is doing what God wants to bring out of this what God wants to develop from this I think that is an important part David felt overwhelmed by various things here some of his enemies these psalms he's writing here David constantly had enemies who were after him sometimes even his own family his own kids rebelled against him and fought against him, put up an army against him. Um, so sometimes, our, sometimes we may feel overwhelmed by a, a lack of fellowship with God, a, hopeless, a, a hopelessness. You know, if you don't have fellowship with God, you're on your own out there in the world. You are saying, whatever the devil throws at me, I can handle it. You can't handle it. Don't make the mistake I made one time. Get up in front of the whole church and say, the devil can bring whatever he wants. I'm ready. I ain't worried about the devil. About six months later, I was about ready to call uncle. Amen? And say, I had enough. At this spiritual pit in David's life, he claims and finds God to be faithful to him. He stopped. He thought about it. He thought about what he was going through, and he thought about God. And I'm going to get to that here in just a minute. I'm going to pull it up. I want you to see what David did. He recounted his life situation, and then he recounted the goodness of God. And he put those two together. And which one do you think won? The faithfulness of God. So it changed his thinking into poor pitiful me. Guys, I'm telling you, the battle goes on in your heart and in your mind. And if we sit around and think, poor pitiful me, that'll consume us. But if we think about the goodness of God, and what does God want to bring out of this, He will do great and mighty things. Satan wants you to think that your problems are a result of God not caring for you. Would you agree with that? It's one of the things he wants you to believe. God's not really, God not really taking, the, the devil's got control of your life and God really don't care. He'll tell you stuff like that. Where's your God right now? And we know that happens in our minds a lot, don't we? Why do we experience dark times? Let's talk about some of those reasons. Number one, sometimes because of our bad choices. Let's be honest. Have you ever gone through some tough times in your life because you, you brought it on yourself? <laughs> Stacy said, I'm, I'm denying that, and I'm still denying it. I ain't going to let it. We have to be honest. Sometimes we create our own hardships, our own. We sit around and cry because of some of the stupid things we do. I think every person in here right now could, could, name, could make us a little list right quick. You could name a few things that probably were you, you did the wrong thing and you brought some hardships on your life. Am I right or am I wrong? Every one of us could do that. Second thing, 
Sometimes we experience dark times because the Father wants to get our attention. And He allows us to go through these things. He allows us to hurt. He allows us to be broken as we've talked about. And because He wants us to get to that place that the psalmist here got to, that when he talked about all this brokenness in verse 10, it says, where is your God? And he continues to talk about, why are you cast down, O my soul, verse 11? And why are you disquieted within me? But then he stops. And he, after talking to himself, he says, I will hope in God. And I will yet praise Him. And so... You see the battle that he has going on inside of him. And number three, sometimes just because, sometimes we go through dark times just simply because it's not because God's trying to get your attention. It's not because you did anything wrong. Sometimes we go through hard times simply because life's not fair and it's not easy. And we live in a sin-cursed world. And the God of this world is the devil himself. The Bible says the little g God of this world is the devil and he's a liar and a murderer and a thief. And he's the one who wants to come and steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to make your life as miserable as he possibly can. Yeah, look what he did to Job. And I'm here to tell you there are times that life is just not easy. Right? We... we but we should never get to the place that we should think, because I'm a child of God, I should be different from everybody else. I should not have all these problems. Don't forget what I tell you. That's heaven. That's not here. We live in a sin-cursed world. Man, the first garden, when they, when they moved in the Garden of Eden, there wasn't any, I, I believe there wasn't any thorn bushes until they sinned. And then they had to work the old ground by the sweat of their brow. And thorns became a, that symbol of sin. And that's just, that's just a supposal that it seems to me. And I've heard that preached before uh, by people that, that uh, some biblical reasons behind that. But, but I'm saying to you that life is full of briars and thorns and hard times. I say that because I got one Stuck in my finger yesterday, and I still feel it. So notice how David at a dark time seemed to bring him back to God as a source of hope. Chapter 40, chapter, verse 5, there in verse 42, in chapter 42, For I will still praise him. Look at this one. Look at this next one. Verse 3, I should have put it first. Praise God in all things, even when tears have been his food day and night. Still praising God. It's almost like David said, I'm, I'm, I'm sinking, I'm sinking, but I'm still going forward. I'm sinking, but I'm still looking up. You know, sometimes that's where you are. When E.V. Hill did his wife's funeral, preached his wife's funeral, he said, I'm crying and I'm getting stronger. I'm crying and I'm getting stronger. Sometimes that's how it works. It's through those tears that we get stronger. Because you have to look up. It's what you do through those tears that makes a difference. <clears throat> and then verses 6 and 9 says, Even when oppressed by my enemy and in sorrow, his acknowledgement of God's faithfulness allows God to touch his attitude. Sometimes God needs to touch our attitude. And I know it's probably none of you. It would probably be somebody that comes on Sunday morning to church that doesn't come the rest of the week, you know, they just come on Sunday morning, that could every now and then get a bad attitude. None of y'all, right? <laughs> Thank you, Waylon, for the help. You know, we, we do that sometimes. I, I, we, David, though, is acknowledging God's faithfulness through his brokenness. And our time is just about gone. 
Look at this third one, and we'll finish up. This is really brief. Dark times help us conquer despair. They help us conquer despair. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, that's a type of, of uh, oppression, despair. I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. He didn't say, stay close to me and you'll never get in the fire, did he? He didn't say, stay close to me and the waters, will ne they'll never touch you. You don't, you'll never have to go through any waters, any floods. No, what he says is when they come. I like the story about the, you know, building your house upon the sand and how the Bible, does the Bible say if the rains come? When, when doesn't it? It says when the rains come and batter against your house. If it's on the sand, it will fall. If it's on the rock, it will stand. Isn't it amazing? What's the key to you having a good day tomorrow? Start it right. Start that day right. Acknowledging God. Getting that attitude adjustment that we need sometimes. <laughs> you said his better, better day would be if his wife has a good attitude. So it would make him have a great day. <laughs> And I'm sure that feeling goes both ways, right? Yeah. All right. The enemies of victory. Look at what they are. Here's some of the enemies of victory. Some of the enemies of you getting victory over this whatever oppression, depression, whatever you're facing, is the people the devil uses to hinder you. You got anybody like that? Maybe somebody that works at the desk beside you. Or maybe a neighbor. Maybe a neighbor that cuts all their trash and throws it over the fence in your yard. The devil uses people sometimes to hinder us, doesn't he? We think about that sometimes. Just being overwhelmed by the daily responsibilities of life. Sometimes the, the enemies of victory is just, we're just too busy. We're overwhelmed. I long for the days that I think about the older folks who came up in a day when they didn't have air conditioning and everybody sat out on the front porch in the shade in the afternoon and visited and, you know, maybe worked the garden a little while and came back and sat and visited and people knew each other. But how did you make it without... Social media, Brother Ray, without, without TikTok, without emails, and without text messages, Brother Ray. <laughs> In those days, did you think it was the good old days then? Did you? No way you would have thought we'd be where we are today. I'm going to tell you, folks, one of the greatest enemies to your joy is getting overwhelmed by daily responsibilities in life. And I am one to talk because I'm having to learn to unload some stuff. But I'm not learning it real good or real quick. Unpaid bills can cause it. Undisciplined kids or unhappy marriage. I, for some reason that didn't print up there, but I had unhappy marriage. Those things, just, just relationships or finances can all cause, cause us to really battle for victory in our lives. Look at this one. What to do in the dark times, that's not supposed to be at the bottom. That's decided to do its own thing, I guess. Look at these four, and this is, I got one other slide and we're through. Stop and think about your condition, what to do in dark times. This, is a, this may be the best slide of, the whole, of all of them, so you may want to write, if you want to write anything down, if you're struggling, this is what to do about it. Stop and think about your condition. That's what the psalmist did three times in these two little short psalms. He said, 
what in the, I'm going to put it in Okaloosa terms, what in the world is going on? He grabbed himself by the nap of the neck and said, why are you so down? Brother Alton Thompson, who used to be my preacher when I was growing up, his name was Alton Earl Thompson, and he used to say, sometimes I just have to take Alton Earl out there in the woods and tie him up to a tree and give him a little what for. <laughs> sometimes I just have to take him out and have a hard, long talk with him. Sometimes we need to do that, don't we? Why are you so down? Sometimes stop and count your blessings. Instead of your, well, I don't have this, or I don't have that. Number two, stop and concentrate on your God. Stop and concentrate on God. Get your mind off the other little failures and problems and things. You know, sometimes young ladies are really bad about these young girls. I remember, I remember Candy one time. I didn't ask permission to share this, but I will share it now. But she was talking to a little friend, and she was about 12 or 13, maybe 14. I don't know, 12 or 13, I think. And she was telling that other little girl on the computer. They were talking on the computer, and she was telling her, she said, it is so hard being single. And she was 12 or 13. She didn't have a boyfriend right then. <laughs> she, said, she said, it is so hard being single. I'm like, dear God, if she had a clue. She doesn't have a clue. But that was just one of her blonde moments. We, got a whole, we could write a book on them. Number three, we don't have, we're not going to talk about them. I'm not going to talk about them. Number three, compare God to your problem. Stop and think about your condition. Stop and think about your God. Now compare God to your problem. Now, by the way, this is just for people that want help overcoming. If you don't want any help, don't write these down. If you don't know anybody, it'd be good to know these to help somebody else, maybe. And then number four, decide in your will to be strong in the Lord. You know, Ephesians 6 says that. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might that you may overcome the evils. I forget exactly how it's worded. The evils of the devil or the, the evil one. All right. Uh, one more thing. Habakkuk. Look at this closing verse. Habakkuk, it's in your book. And by the way, there's a couple of little worksheets on your pages we gave you tonight. Uh, if you can, take time and, and in your own time, work through those. Think about it. This is mentioned and it says, this is a hymn. And it says you can take it and make your, write your own hymn based upon your experiences. There's one on page 39 and one on page 43. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food. Now, you know, you and I say, I'll just run down to Walmart if none of that comes through. They didn't have no Walmart, did they? That means you wasn't going to eat. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. If there's a verse that you and I maybe ought to memorize, I think that would be a good one. That would be a good one. Let's close in prayer. Father, as we conclude tonight, we do thank you for loving us. We are thankful, God, that you are sufficient to override all of our issues that trouble us. We ask for your help, O oh Lord. We ask you to help us to see the error of our thinking. 
we ask you to help us to rejoice in who you are. And Father, to walk in victory. And not think the way the devil would have us to think. But to think about victory in Jesus. And it's in his name.